All right, thanks for tuning in with us, our Monday night prayer meeting. Let's go ahead and have a word of prayer before we jump right into the lesson. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you, Lord, for all you've given us. Thank you, Lord, for the many blessings of this life, God, even the things that we uh, don't even think of, Lord. We, we thank you now, Lord, for just watching over us, taking care of us, Lord. And I pray, God, that you continue to keep us safe and healthy, Lord, to uh, help further your kingdom, Lord. I want to pray a special prayer, Lord, for those that are sick now. I think of Brother Ted, Brother Marvin, Lord, those that are uh, struggling with some health issues. God, I pray that you'd be with them in a very special way. Just touch their bodies, Lord. You know the need. I pray, Lord, that uh, other members of the church can be of an encouragement to them during this difficult time. And I pray, Lord, that you continue to be with the leaders of our church, Uncle Mike, Lord, and Brother Jared, Lord, and uh, Lord, everybody on staff here that helps uh, kind of keep the wheels turning, Lord, in the ministry. I pray, Lord, that you'd help them, uh, help them, Lord, to uh, be strengthened and uplifted in their work, Lord. And um, I pray, Lord, that you'd be with us as members to be faithful and not only to hear your word, but be a doer of it throughout the week. I pray, Lord, that we can continue to, Lord, guard your word in our heart, that we might not sin against you, Lord. But even above and beyond that, Lord, just striving to search the scriptures daily, Lord, and being in your perfect will, I pray, Lord, that you'd help us, God, to experience a personal revival in our hearts every day, uh, Lord, to be drawn closer to you, that we can continue reaching this city, this nation, this world for the cause of Christ. Lord, I pray, God, that even now as we study your word a little bit tonight, I pray, Lord, that you just uh, open our hearts and minds, that we can understand clearly what you'd have us to hear tonight. Lord, I pray, God, that it would be an encouragement to someone out there listening. I pray, Lord, that... Um, uh, we could take it and use it and apply it to our daily life. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right. Uh, I actually got to preach uh, the watch night service, and I preached out of Luke 5, a pretty interesting passage about Peter uh, out there toiling all night, but he had taken nothing. Uh, and the title of my message that night was Launching Out, when Christ asked him to launch out into the deep and uh, really tied in some spiritual aspects to that about how we as Christians need to have enough faith in Christ to be able to step out and do more things for the Lord, get more involved, uh, just really leaning and trusting on those everlasting arms on a daily basis. Uh, but I'm going to kind of continue that thought uh, with a, a key phrase that we find in verse number 5 of Luke chapter 5. We're going to start reading in verse 4. It says, Now when he had left speaking... He said unto Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draught. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we've told all night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I'll let down the net. And so what we find here, uh, no doubt Peter has had hesitations about going out in the deep. He'd been fishing all night. He was tired. Um, I think in, in a certain way, he might have been trying to explain to Jesus his case, which we often do. <laughs> Lord, I, I'm tired. We've got a lot of things going on. And you, know, you just don't understand my situation, Lord. But eventually, I, I feel like he had the right perspective when he said, at thy word, I'll let down the net. So that's the phrase we want to focus on tonight, at thy word. So how can we have a, a faith so firm in the Lord and his word uh, to provoke action in us, to actually go forward, uh, do the will of God, and how can we trust such a word? There's a couple things that Peter had to consider uh, in trusting Christ and taking him at his word. Uh, number one, he had to consider the foundation of his word. Notice he wasn't just trusting in the words of Jesus Christ, he was actually trusting in, in two things, uh, the words of Christ and the origin of those words. Where are they coming from? Who's saying these words? Uh, and now, just to be honest with you, there's certain people that I, I talk to and I hear, and you know, we tend to take things with a grain of salt when they when they speak. But there's some people when they give me a statistic or a fact, or or uh, maybe they're uh, you know telling about something that had happened, and they're very detail oriented. I, I tend to to listen up and and really take that into consideration when they when they say something worth saying. But we find here not only are the words that Christ said important, but understanding the foundation of his word, the foundation of his word. In this case, uh, the two are one and the same. And John 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Then we jump down to verse number 14 and it said the word was made flesh 
and dwelt among us. So we find that in the beginning, it wasn't God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost necessarily. It was God the Father, God the Word, and God the Holy Ghost. So we find that Word being made flesh, Emmanuel, for us uh, should hold just as much weight as Christ was here with us now. So many times I read the Bible stories, I think, man, how cool would it be if Christ was was living in our day, you know, it'd be nice to meet him and hear, hear him speak. And, but in reality, we do. God left us not only with a comforter, the Holy Spirit that abides in us, but he left us with his word that we can read and access the entire canon of the scriptures every day. We can study God's word as if he's speaking directly to us. So we should take that word every time we read, every time we hear a message preached, we should take him at his word. Okay, Lord, you're speaking to me. Uh, there's something I need to understand about this. So the foundation of his word, no doubt, um, some defining characteristics of our King James Bible that I'm going to mention here tonight. Uh, letter A, it's inerrant. It's inerrant. Uh, Psalm 12, 6 said, The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times. So there, there's no error. There are no mistakes in, in God's word. Uh, there are no contradictions. It's, it's interesting. You read throughout the Gospels and all these different stories and you read the accounts of Luke and the accounts of Mark and, and they all tend to kind of harmonize together because it's all God's Word. It, Mark didn't see one thing and, and John saw something completely different. Uh, for example, we use the illustration of maybe uh, witnesses to a car accident. So you have one guy standing on this side of the street, the other guy maybe looking up from a balcony, the other guy on the other side of the street. And uh, they all have different perspectives and different points of view. But at the end of the day, it's always going to be a red car and a blue car that, that have the accident. Do you follow? So there's no contradiction in the story. And that's honestly how they, how they handle a lot of these proceedings, uh, judging things like that, is, is stringing together the witnesses' reports and validifying that with... Um, you know, the accounts that they've given. So we find that God in his word, you can read the entire word of God and not find a single contradiction. Now, if you do find a contradiction, maybe something that was a mistake, uh, be sure that uh, you're the one that's mistaken, okay? If there is an error that we find in the word of God, the error is on our part. So many times uh, people use that excuse, you know, as a crutch, wow, well, you know, the Bible's not perfect anyway, so we shouldn't treat it as such and, and let it affect us in such a way. But you know, the, the problem is um, they didn't find any contradictions in the Word itself. They found contradictions of themselves compared to the Word, right? So they read God's Word and they find the fault in themselves, not necessarily in the Word. So therefore, they quit reading it. So um, letter B, not only is it an errant, but it's also infallible. This word infallible is, is, is really interesting because it kind of takes it a step further. It doesn't say it, not only does it not have errors, but it's not capable of committing errors. Man, that's just an awesome testament to the Lord. Uh, in, in Titus 1, 2, it said, uh, to the God who cannot lie. It didn't say that God that wouldn't lie, uh, but it said he couldn't lie. So this word of God, not only does it not have errors, but it, it's incapable of, of having errors those errors. It's, in, it's infallible. It's, uh, the Bible says in Psalm 119.89, thy word is settled in heaven. So we find even before the foundations of the world, uh, God had already settled his word. He just found a way to put it on paper for us to read, right? So there was no changing in all the translations. God managed to preserve his word and give us a very perfect, infallible, and errant word of God. Uh, one of the unknown writers said, This book is the mind of God, the state of man, the way of salvation, the fate of sinners, and the happiness of believers. His doctrines are holy, his precepts are binding, his stories are true, and his decisions are immutable and changeable. Read it to be wise, believe it to be safe, practice it to be holy. It contains light to direct you, food to sustain you, and a comfort to cheer you. It's the traveler's map, the pilgrim's staff, the pilot's compass, the soldier's sword, and the Christian's character. Christ is the great subject, our good, its design, and the glory of God, its end. He must fill the memory, govern the heart, and guide the feet. Read it slowly, often, prayerfully, and it is a mine of riches, a paradise of glory, and a river 
of pleasure. I don't know if I could have explained it better myself. It exactly is the Word of God. So we find it's, it's inerrant, it's infallible, and, and, and let us see, it's inspired. Uh, 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scriptures given by inspiration. You know that word inspiration means God breathed. It wasn't uh, suggestions that God was handing out to the uh, different authors that uh, he used to write God's word. He was literally as if he were standing over their shoulder, telling them word by word what to write down in the word of God. So we have a very inspired and guided word of God that was meant to touch us in a certain way where anyone can pick up his word and say, you know what, God is speaking to me. God is dealing with my heart. Um, as Uncle Mike always says when he preaches, uh, we should hear every message as if uh, they're preaching it to us and us alone. So uh, 1 Peter 1.23 says, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which lives and abides forever. So uh, number two, we're going to look at not only the foundation of his word, but the function of of his word. What does what that function in our daily life in a, in a practical manner look like? Second Timothy 3.14, jumping a couple verses before that, says, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of. That should be the word of God. We've learned these things. We've been assured of them. Not only confirmation given by God, but also by our brothers and sisters in Christ, safety in the multitude of counsel, uh, knowing of whom thou hast learned him, and that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise in the salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. So later it goes on saying, as we read already, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So here we have two options every time we hear God's Word being taught, preached, anytime we read it, we have two options, either accept or receive it or reject God's word. Luke 5, 5 says, And Simon answering said to him, Master, we have told all night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. You know, oftentimes we have the tendency to only take God at his word when it seems logical, when it makes sense in our mind. But let me, let me challenge you by saying, I'm sure that building an ark didn't seem very logical to people who have never even seen rain. I'm sure that leaving, if you were to study out the, the exodus that where the children of Israel left Egypt, they actually went up to a safe haven that could have been a very fortified place for them to kind of hunker down and protect themselves. They went all the way up there and then turned around straight back to the sea just to be delivered in the hands of the Egyptians. So it didn't make sense to maybe turn around and go that way and, and march towards a, a deep sea uh, toward their death, but God had a plan, and he, he opened that Red Sea. He, he divided that Red Sea, and it wasn't logical, but they did it. It probably wasn't logical to march around a city uh, to see the walls fall, but they saw it happen. And so we, we got to put aside our human reasoning um, and trust God at his word, whether it seems logical or not. No doubt it, it didn't seem logical for the children of Israel to look at the bronze serpent when they were bitten by one of those fiery serpents, just to be able to look and, and to live, that doesn't make sense. You know, they've, they've got to seek a doctor. They've got to, they've got to cut the poison out and suck it out. And, and, and they've got to take action in their own hands because that's what's logical. It's not logical to look and to live. But, you know, that's exactly what Christ wants in our life. Uh, um, Proverbs 3, 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not into thine own understanding. In all thy ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. So that's exactly what Christ wants to do, is to uh, trust in, in the Lord. And it's, it's interesting, the Spanish word they, they use to translate this word trust is not just uh, maybe a, you know, a mental trust, but it's, it's talking about fixing your trust on the Lord, uh, about uh, having a fixation in the Lord. I, I know uh, the Greek word actually taking it back to its root, it has the concept of lying face down uh, in submission to a captain um, of, of an army. So it's a very vulnerable position at many times. It's a very humble position, but that's the exact position we should hold before Christ our Lord anytime he gives us uh, a command or a word. Uh, James 1.19 says, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. So we find that God's given us one mouth, 
but two ears. So we should be hearing a lot more than we are talking. I think Peter maybe struggled with that many times in his Christian walk with the Lord. And, and God said, you know, launch out, let your net down. Oh, but we've toiled all night. And he began to explain. Uh, no doubt in the back of his mind, he's thinking, Jesus, you know, you do your teaching and your preaching thing, but I'm a fisherman. I know what I'm doing. Logically, after fishing all night, it just doesn't make sense to go back and try to do it in the day a few hours later. It's not going to happen. Logically, it doesn't make sense, but we need to receive the word that God gives us and trust that he's going to bring it to fruition uh, according to his will and not ours. Uh, a really cool passage of scripture um, in Acts chapter 17 Verse number 11 says, These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. So here they are listening to the preaching and the teachings of Paul, and they find that they received the word with all readiness of mind. Now that, that readiness of mind, it implies like an Olympic runner. If, if you ever noticed, if they're doing like a relay race, the, the one that's preparing to maybe receive the baton and to continue running, their, their arms aren't crossed, they're not looking up into the sky, they're not checking their Facebook status, they are in a position where they're ready to receive that baton and immediately take off with it into action. That's how we should be receiving God's Word. Do you come to God's house and sit in the pew and, and look around and occupy your mind with, with other things? You're not receiving it with readiness of mind. Do you, do you try to read your Bible as you're um, you know, doing something else and, and maybe your attention's not fully in the Word of God? I, I'm telling you, you might not be receiving it with all readiness of mind. Uh, prepared unto action is what that implies. So we should, we should have that uh, good example even given in Ezra. Chapter number 7, verse 10. I know I'm jumping around a lot, but I, I like using passages to make my point. Ezra 7, 10 says, For Ezra had prepared uh, his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. So pretty interesting how it says not only he prepared his heart to seek the Lord, but to do it and then to teach it. So there's a threefold process there. Uh, that's, how much better could it get? Not only be prepared to, to, to receive it, but also uh, to do it and then to teach it. Uh, very, very important. Uh, I, I know many times we hear the same messages in and out. It reminds me of a pastor one time. A new pastor took over a church and he came and, man, he preached the message and uh, with, with all of his glory and he was compassionate and uh, really just gave him a good message from the Lord. And, and then uh, next week rolled by and two or three weeks later, uh, one of the members came up. They said, Pastor, I couldn't help but notice you're preaching the same message every single week. He said, well, I haven't seen any change, so maybe if you would change, I would go on to something else. So if it feels that way in our Christian life, reading his word, uh, listening to messages, maybe God's trying to tell us something. Maybe we need to take him at his word and be surrendered to it, uh, knowing who's saying those words, first and foremost, the origin of those words, the foundation of his word. We should be able to take it at face value without any hesitation as law in our hearts. We put so much faith in the counsel of our friends and our family and our coworkers and, and God forbid Google. We, I mean, we go to Google and YouTube for everything. If you don't know how to tie your shoes, you can find that on Google. But when's the last time you've went to God's word and say, Lord, teach me something today. I'm going to rely on this word as if I'm relying on this stage to even hold me up and support me. We should take God at his word and then you'll start seeing nets breaking with fish. You'll start seeing walls come down. You'll start seeing an ark encompass you and protect you uh, throughout the storms. You'll start seeing the, the Red Seas divided and you'll start seeing spiritual healing when you look and live on Jesus Christ. And if you're not doing that, let me encourage you, take God at his word. And the more time you spend in his word, the more you'll be able to take him at his word. So I hope that was a blessing to you tonight. I hope it was an encouragement. It was to me. Uh, one of the only ways we can launch out deeper into a relationship with the Lord is by taking him at his word and then seeing what he does with it. Okay, let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you, Lord, for what we've heard. I pray that you'd help us to take it and to apply it. Uh, be with each and every one of us, Lord, until we come back here uh, Wednesday night, Lord. Uh, be with all the things that are going on this week, those that are sick. Uh, be with them in a very special way. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.